Good morning, everybody. For, uh, for those of you who don't know me, I am Colin Poulton, uh, and it's my pleasure on behalf of PLAS and Future Agricultures to welcome you to this conference on the political economy of agricultural policy in Africa. Um, I hope, like me, you're very much looking forward to the next three days. I think we have a, a great group of people uh, lined up here, um, and a great group of people will mean a, will mean a great conference. Uh, and that's the, the comfort I take as an organizer. You're all here, it's going to be great. Um, I'm excited that this conference brings together uh, people with direct policy experience, policy makers, uh, people from civil society groups and academia. I'm looking forward to the exchange we're going to have across those different groups. And I'm also excited that um, there are so many different research groups who are presenting their work here. And um, I suspect that we don't all know each other's work, and this is a great opportunity to have a conversation and learning uh, across ourselves as well. So for those reasons, I, I think the next three days are going to be great. Possibly at this point, it's a good uh, opportunity to say uh, thank you to uh, DFID, who have funded Future Agricultures since it started way back in 2005, in fact, and therefore it's with because of their funding that we're able to put on this uh, conference uh, today. But I'd also like to thank uh, all the people from the other research programs uh, for finding the funding to bring together your speakers for your session. So there are about eight different groups, all of whom have uh, found money from their own funds to, to contribute to this, this conference. So thank you very much to all of those uh, other groups as well. As I said, uh, Future Agricultures has been uh, running since 2005. We're actually coming to the end of a current funding phase at the end of this month, but then changing into a new uh, organization, FAC Africa, which will be officially launched tomorrow evening. So after our sessions finish tomorrow, there will be a launch event tomorrow evening at 6.30 uh, in your conference packs, you will hopefully have found an invitation to that, but please come along anyway to uh, celebrate the, the launch of FAC Africa tomorrow. One of the uh, things that FAC has always tried to do uh, is not just to contribute to policy debates about future directions for African agriculture, but to stimulate them and to engage in those debates with other groups. So this conference, having multiple groups uh, here, very much fits the way that FAC has always uh, tried to, to work. Another of the other things that, that FAC has always seen as one of its distinctives is to try and give profile to political economy analysis of agricultural policy questions. Um, we have different disciplines represented within the membership of FAC in uh, our various African countries and UK. Um, but within, within the work we do, we always try and look at the, the politics of the policy as well as just the technical content of it. And so it's fitting, I think, that this conference marking the end of one phase of FAC and the start of uh, another one uh, has this as its theme. And various people have said to me that, um, has there, have there been a conference like this before? And to which I, I answer, I think, is not that I'm aware of. And we very much hope that this conference will give, sort of greater, help give greater prominence to the, the, the use of political economy analysis in agricultural policy making in Africa. I came originally from an ag economics background and for many years, or I was looking at the content of policy uh, as an important determinant of agricultural performance. But whenever you get engaged in those debates, you end up talking about the role of the state, whether it's in providing core public goods, whether it's playing a slightly more interventionist role in helping develop agricultural markets, 
or whether from another perspective it's saying it's messing things up and ought to get out of the way. But whichever way you come at it, and whatever your view is, the role of the state ends up being critical, even though we all, I imagine, acknowledge that agricultural growth is ultimately private sector led. And when you start talking about the role of the state, you then get into, well, what are the incentives for state action? Uh, and eventually, on the process of working back, um, the conclusion that, uh, that I came to is very much it's the political system that generates those incentives for action, whether they be incentives to be very uh, supportive uh, of smallholder agriculture growth, committed to investment, looking to learn what works, what doesn't, change policy appropriately, or whether it's just to neglect agriculture because it doesn't class as particularly important in your set of priorities, that the, the political system ultimately uh, is, is where those sort of big decisions, uh, big incentives lie. In some of our work, you've, I think you've seen um, some of you in the conference packs a paper that we put together on democratization. We've been looking at some of the drivers of incentives for, for state action in agricultural policy. We've looked at democratization, what will that reverse um, past a sense of urban bias against agriculture or possibly just neglect of, of agriculture. Um, our basic answer is we think it, it isn't uh, doing much to reverse that just yet, but we have sessions on that at this, at this conference where we explore those questions. Um, we have looked at the role of civil society in generating demand amongst smallholder households for uh, stronger policy in support of agricultural, uh, agricultural growth for smallholders. Again, we have uh, sessions here which will discuss uh, the <coughs> potential role and the capacity of civil society organizations to, to do that. State capacity has come up in our thinking quite a lot where states where maybe the incentives to invest in agriculture are not that strong, but there are some incentives to do that, but then you come up against the question of low state capacity uh, amongst agencies working in agricultural policy. And in the medium term and in the long term, state capacity is, is, is endogenous to political incentives. But in the short term, it's probably a given for most policymakers. And given the short planning horizons and time horizons that many policymakers have, and which may have been exacerbated by democratization, uh, state capacity becomes a big issue. So I hope that state capacity will be one of the themes that uh, recurs through our discussions over the next three days. We have a number of uh, sub-themes that will appear uh, during the conference. You may have picked some of those up in, uh, uh, in the program if you've looked through it. I'll just name three. Um, today there will be a, uh, something of a focus on the engagement of uh, the BRICS of Brazil and China uh, in uh, African agriculture. So we'll have a plenary session and there will be a parallel session on, on that today. Um, tomorrow we want, we'll be thinking particularly about CADAP, uh, Comprehensive African Agriculture Development Program, which is we're reaching 10 years since the, the Maputo Declaration in 2003, uh, where African heads of states committed to redouble their efforts to support uh, agriculture to put 10% of their national budgets in support of agriculture and to adopt the CADAP process as a way of improving the quality of agricultural planning and we'll be taking stock of that uh, 10 years on uh, tomorrow but as with all things in this conference looking at how it engages with the political incentives domestically uh, to invest in African agriculture what traction it's able to get uh, with the domestic politics uh, around ag agriculture. And then on day three, we'll be 
looking a bit at lands. There are two uh, parallel sessions at different times looking at uh, large-scale land deals. Um, one of the consequences of a certain amount of neglect of smallholder agriculture in many countries has been a, a renewed interest, I think, in large-scale uh, land deals. Maybe you can achieve some of your objectives as policymakers through bringing in large-scale investors, uh, and we'll be looking at that in day three. There are other themes. If yours hasn't been mentioned there, apologize. There will be a number of sub-themes working through the, the program, but I hope you'll find it's a, a rich program. Uh, and we very much look forward to the debates we're going to have. I guess my final reflection is, ultimately, we want to have a, a stimulating debate, but we want to draw lessons uh, for policy. And if we're wanting to showcase the role that political economy analysis can, can play in uh, policy debates, we want to be able to say at the end of the conference, well, as we start thinking more about these things, what, what's the value added? to policy debate, and I hope that we will have some answers uh, to that by the end of the three days. Anyway, that's the, the challenge for us. Um, so once again, um, it's my privilege to welcome you. I hope you very much enjoy the next three days, and I'm going to hand over to, to Blessings and Adebayo for our first session this morning. Welcome. Uh, good morning once again. Uh, my duty this morning is a humble one. Uh, it is to introduce uh, our keynote uh, speaker who will kick off uh, uh, the conference. Uh, our keynote uh, speaker is uh, a distinguished African scholar, uh, Adebayo Orokoshi, who is uh, currently the director of the United Nations African Institute for Economic uh, Development and Planning uh, based in Dakar, Senegal. He is also uh, an interim director of uh, the African Governance uh, Institute, also based uh, in Dakar. I think I will not uh, waste uh, much of your time. Uh, I will go straight to uh, invite Adebayo to give us his note, keynote uh, address. Professor Adebayo. Well, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, colleagues. I was hesitant to go to the podium in order not to appear to you like a priest uh, this early Monday morning, giving out uh, sermons about agriculture and uh, political economy issues. Um, but let me begin by thanking um, Colin and Blessings and perhaps uh, the biggest culprit of all, uh, Ian Schooners, uh, for the invitation to be here. Uh, to share and exchange with you. Um, by the time I got in here yesterday evening and went through the final program, I began to ask myself if I didn't make a mistake in accepting the invitation to be here. Uh, first, because I had expected to be part of uh, a three-person panel of uh, speakers this morning, uh, giving the opening keynote. Uh, but perhaps also interestingly that I, I saw names of colleagues, uh, Ole Tekilson, uh, Ian Skunes, and others, people whom I'd known over the years for some 20 years, who are themselves perhaps more eminently qualified uh, to be sitting here this morning uh, in order to share with you a lifetime of work which they have undertaken uh, around issues of African agriculture. Uh, my own work is mostly around the politics of development of which agriculture is but one small component. And uh, I tend to be almost a jack of all trades and a master of none. And uh, to speak, therefore, before a, a group of experts uh, gave me a bit of trepidation uh, yesterday evening. But nevertheless, I thought I would take the bull by the horn and uh, perhaps uh, throw some challenges to you this morning around the broad theme of the political economy of agricultural policy in contemporary Africa. Um, I thought I should perhaps begin by locating the context of this meeting around six or seven broad um, significant developments, both historical and contemporaneous, which provide a very useful backdrop to the discussions and exchange, exchanges which we'll be having over the next three days. 
Um, perhaps by accident, we're in South Africa, but this year in South Africa, June 19 precisely, will mark 100 years of the Native Land Act. Uh, that act which legalized the dispossession of the lands of uh, Africans in favor of a settler minority, uh, which effectively began a process of the rewriting of the history of this continent uh, and of South Africa in particular around the theory and practice of apartheid as it consolidated itself. And uh, in the end, uh, perhaps unwittingly, this conference might in fact flag off one in a series, I know already of four such conferences, which will be held this year uh, to commemorate the 100th uh, anniversary of the 1913 Native Land Act uh, of South Africa. Of course, the legacies of uh, apartheid are beginning to erode, but uh, important uh, elements of the consequences uh, of uh, the apartheid system still remain in the South African uh, political economy and will constitute part of the discussions around the land and agrarian question in South Africa, where interesting debates uh, have taken place uh, over time as to whether there is, in fact, uh, an agrarian question as distinct from a land question uh, in South Africa, debates which I think will connect with some of the issues uh, that we will be covering over the next uh, three days. But uh, beyond the immediate South Africa context, I think another important contextual uh, factor to keep in mind uh, as we begin our deliberations is the fact that um, Africa, on account of a confluence of factors, has witnessed a major revival um, of policy and to some extent political interest in the agricultural sector. Uh, many factors which account for this revival of interest, I suggest that two of the most proximate of these factors are the initiatives which are being driven from above uh, on a continental scale by the African Union as part of its broader strategy of establishing across different domains and sectors a series of pan-African conventions standards and agreements around which state policy at the municipal and domestic level uh, is expected to gravitate over time as governments domesticate agreements which they reach at the continental level, including in agriculture, where from the Maputo Declaration of 2003 to which um, reference was made uh, a, a few minutes ago, uh, and the CADAP framework amongst other initiatives, including the Land Policy Initiative, uh, sponsored by the Africa Development Bank, the Economic Commission for Africa, and the African Union, uh, comprise what I call a series of initiatives from above that have had uh, a salutary effect on the revival of policy interest and political interest at the national level in agriculture. Um, but I think perhaps for many governments also, uh, after 25 years of economic stagnation and decline, uh, which characterized the crisis and adjustment years of the 80s and 90s into the new millennium, um, the resumption of growth which they began to experience and the threat to growth which the triple crisis uh, of a few years ago including the element of uh, the food crisis, uh, which confronted many countries and potentially destabilized their macro uh, stability, especially their balance of payments, uh, not to talk of the political fallout uh, arising from uh, increases in the price of basic food commodities uh, as governments held back, uh, exporting countries held back on uh, the sale in international markets of rice, uh, and of uh, wheat and other commodities, uh, uh, basically jolted governments uh, back into uh, uh, a, an awareness uh, of the need to pay great, uh, greater attention uh, to food security as an exercise, I would argue, uh, not just in regime survival, but also in prudent governance. Um, some will tell you that the, the, the fall of the Mubarak regime uh, cannot be fully understood uh, outside of the context of some of the effects, uh, the lasting effects, including the 
uh, urban riots that accompany the attempt to increase the price of bread uh, on the back of the global uh, rise in the price of wheat on which Egypt, Egypt is highly dependent uh, for, uh, for, for uh, its food security. Um, bread being particularly central to the um, uh, political contracts, the social contracts between state and society in Egypt in which the subsidization of the price of basic consumer commodities, uh, especially bread, uh, was particularly uh, important. Um, at a further level, I would uh, invite us to recall that uh, and keep in mind that this continent is also experiencing new episodes of growth, new episodes of growth which are underpinned in the vast majority of cases, perhaps with the exception of Ethiopia, but in the vast majority of cases underpinned by a boom in the prices of commodities, both agricultural and especially mineral. Um, seven of the fastest growing economies in the world today are in Africa. Uh, a handful of them are experiencing double digit growths, uh, rates of growth. Um, Ethiopia, North Ethiopia, Sierra Leone, for example, uh, the figures suggest a growth rate of anything between 40% and 18% depending on who you read, but certainly double digit. Uh, partly accounted for from the low level from which it, uh, Sierra Leone is starting. But the fact that Sierra Leone today, uh, this year, is expected to receive from the export of one commodity, iron ore, uh, receipts in foreign exchange terms that almost account for, uh, amount to twice what the country has ever had as its highest annual budget uh, in the period since independence. And questions of how to absorb all of that resource uh, into the economy are obviously posed. Um, so we, we seem to be in a boom period, a boom period which I think if we go back to pre previous episodes of growth in the history of post-colonial Africa, uh, we will find uh, perhaps important lessons to learn in terms of how the benefits of growth could be managed uh, and plowed into the economy, including in ways that could be beneficial to the agricultural sector. Uh, whether those lessons will be learned, uh, in fact, are elements of the stuff of the politics of agricultural policy making, which we will be uh, conversing around uh, over the next three days. I would remind us in this connection that one of the most uh, interesting cases of boom uh, in the economy which we saw uh, during previous episodes of growth uh, centered around the experiences of the African oil exporting countries, um, Nigeria, Angola, and, and a handful of others. Uh, and these are countries which, uh, as their economies boomed on the back of a mineral commodity uh, export system, uh, they also saw a degradation of their agricultural policy uh, to a point where commodities in which they were previously self-sufficient, both for the purposes of their domestic food security, uh, but also for the exportation of surpluses, became items that featured significantly on the import profile of those countries as their uh, oil boom experiences uh, proceeded. Um, we can therefore not take it for granted, even though there is now a decisive shift of uh, narrative uh, about Africa from the Afro-pessimism of only 10 years ago, remember the economist and the hopeless continent, or to the Blair and Africa as uh, a scar on the conscience of humanity, uh, to the Afro-enthusiasm of today, um, proclaimed by the likes of McKinsey and others, which speak of an Africa that has become the new frontier, the possible new growth pole for the world that would supplement what uh, China represents in terms of the current configuration uh, of global economic development. Um, and be careful not to be blinded uh, by the Afro-enthusiasm, uh, which we see around us, which we hear every time. Uh, similar also to the caution which I guess our colleagues from India uh, also often uh, bring to our attention, the narrative of India rising. Uh, which, which basically has also dominated much of the discussion around the subcontinent, uh, but which today we see 
is refracted into discussions about Africa. Uh, twice this year already, the Economist magazine has devoted special pages to Africa to celebrate a rising Africa, uh, the era of Afro-enthusiasm, not just optimism, but Afro-enthusiasm has certainly come. Uh, and policymakers might well be tempted to assume that all is well already uh, and they do not need to do much more uh, than they have done. Uh, key to the narrative of Afro-enthusiasm, uh, many factors and examples abound. I will not bore you with them. You are familiar with them. You just need to pick up one of the reports of McKinsey or any of the specialist uh, global consultancy uh, uh, agencies and interests, and you see a, a tale of uh, a litany of uh, factors and indicators of the change which is taking place in Africa. And I do not mean to dismiss them uh, lightly, but I think perhaps two which are particularly important, again, to keep in mind uh, from the point of view of agricultural policy are the processes of urbanization which the African continent is going through. Not an entirely new process, but one which seems to be accelerating uh, in a chaotic manner with a lot of informality around it, but which certainly poses important questions about how the teeming population of urban dwellers, including those who are expected to constitute the population in the eight or so mega cities which Africa is expected to host over the next 20 to 50 years, how to feed that teeming population of people uh, is going to become an important question. Uh, keeping in mind, of course, that the notion of the urban bias to which I will return has always been an important element in the political economy of agricultural policy, at least in so far as we have attempted to conceptualize it in the scholarly literature. The second dimension, of course, is the demographics that accompanies the urbanization process and the particular uh, element of the youth bulge uh, that is integral to the current population profile uh, of the continent. Already for a majority of countries, young people under the age of 35 comprise the majority of the population. Sometimes it figures as high as 65 to 70 percent uh, of the population of some countries uh, categorized today as young people. Uh, but with a majority of them uh, located in an urban milieu uh, and with very little interest, at least from the indications that we have in being directly involved in agricultural uh, production activities. Um, again, this harkens back to the uh, issue of what the implications will be uh, for the sustainability of the agricultural sector and of the long-term food security of the continent, issues which I believe will be at the heart of policy uh, in the years ahead. Uh, still, in terms of uh, some of the uh, backdrop uh, to this meeting, I think we should also um, uh, perhaps keep in mind that uh, over the last few years across Africa, we have seen uh, an acceleration of the process of the alienation of land on the continent by a combination of domestic and external interests. Um, the process of land alienation on a large scale is not new uh, in Africa. Uh, in the post-colonial context, I think part of the concern to expand product output and to expand production and to improve productivity uh, has been connected to interrogations about the efficacy and viability of smallholder agriculture uh, on the continent. Uh, and this has led, in some cases, to the implementation of policies by governments, uh, both before the Green Revolution, but also fueled by the Green Revolution uh, in the appropriation of land by the state, but also by private individuals on a massive scale in order to promote mechanized agriculture, large-scale farming, which hopefully it was thought will help to lift output, improve productivity, and even increase uh, food security. Um, that phase of land alienation, uh, I think, should be distinct, distinguished from the current phase of uh, massive alienation which we are experiencing, partly because of the massive entry by external interests, both public and private, in the appropriation of land, including corporations, 
which ordinarily do not have much to do with direct agricultural activities. So Hyundai or Daewoo producing cars in Korea, or famous more for their cars and their electronic gadgets, uh, suddenly becoming interested investors uh, in land uh, in Africa and buying massive tracts across different uh, zones of the continent in order to grow food crops which are then exported back to their domestic markets uh, in Korea and elsewhere. Uh, Saudi Arabia and wheat production uh, in different parts of uh, the continent, including uh, in places like uh, Senegal uh, or Saudi and Kuwaiti land investments in places like Ethiopia, uh, comprise some of the new elements of land appropriation on a massive scale uh, which we are seeing. An appropriation process which I also remind us feeds into the broader new scramble uh, for the continent, uh, which includes a scramble underwritten by the mineral resource boom that itself is producing a dynamic of massive land appropriation. Uh, China, perhaps the most prominent uh, player in this regard, that is buying vast tracts of land in places like DRC, uh, completes with contracts that not only offer China control over everything on the land, but also everything under the land, um, which I think is an interesting formulation, uh, which many scholars are, uh, are, are, and, and political activists are drawing attention to as being fraught with a lot of problems. Um, I will not go into the uh, issue uh, of uh, an earlier phase of uh, land appropriation in places like Kenya and Ethiopia, uh, connected to the production of flowers, uh, but I pointed out that for the current phase, um, it is interesting that the land that is being appropriated, uh, at least from the point of view of agriculture, is used for the production of food crops for export back uh, to the countries uh, of origin of the investors principally. Uh, and the domestic market itself is not exactly central to the equation, at least for the time being, uh, of the uh, investors, the international investors involved in the uh, appropriation uh, of land. Um, of course, the search for alternative uh, fuels, uh, biodegradable fuels uh, as a substitute to fossil fuels also feed into this process of appropriation, uh, as is uh, the appropriation of coastal lands, uh, especially uh, for tourism, uh, and the construction of hotels on a big scale. Uh, in Senegal, where I live today, um, Dakar used to be famous for its open beaches. Uh, today, those beaches have been completely colonized and taken over by various investor interests, uh, building five-star hotels, casinos, uh, restaurants, and all kinds of things connected to a broader uh, strategy uh, of tourism. Uh, pursued by the Senegalese government. Uh, I've read uh, reports uh, of the example of Tanzania also, where coastal land has been developed uh, and allocated on a massive scale as part of this logic of uh, tourism, uh, much to um, the chagrin of uh, local communities, especially fishing communities, uh, that are then denied access uh, to uh, those resources. Alongside this consolidation uh, of land uh, and its appropriation on a massive scale uh, has been also the uh, emergence of a futures market in African agricultural commodities um, in which speculative buying uh, with multi-year forward positions taken in relation to commodities such as cocoa and coffee uh, have featured prominently in some of the dynamics taking place in global markets. Uh, some of you will recall the, the news uh, a couple of years ago of uh, a British investor who decided to take a position over a period of 10 years, effectively buying up all of the expected output of cocoa uh, and coffee from Cote d'Ivoire in anticipation of price movements uh, as an investment uh, option and vehicle uh, which he, he sought to uh, exercise. Um, Finally, for the purposes of, of this presentation, I think it's also important to note that the array of players, I think it's almost logical from what I have said uh, so far, that the array of players and interests in the African agricultural sector has also expanded considerably uh, over the last few years. Uh, 
Uh, I think back to the debates of the 50s and 60s uh, and the kinds of issues covered in the literature. And it was really very much about the public sector, about the state uh, and the smallholder farmers. Uh, it was basically a range of actors defined in terms of the domestic national territorial space. Uh, today, I think it's absolutely impossible, completely impossible, to discuss African agriculture and African agricultural policy uh, options and choices without paying attention to the fact that we now have key NGO players in the sector, we have philanthropic entrepreneurs in the sector, we have private foundations and donors of various kinds uh, which are directly involved uh, both in uh, uh, experimental initiatives uh, of various kinds, but also in lobbying and advocating for policy uh, around the choices which are available to the state. Uh, producing, therefore, a much more complex interface than ever before between the domestic and external determinants of policy in the agricultural sector. Uh, there has been an internationalization uh, uh, and if it was always there, there has been an enhanced and a consolidated internationalization of African agricultural policy such that the determinants and outcomes of policy are not themselves solely uh, the province of the domestic actors but are also tied to a complex of international players and interests including the seed companies that uh, wield enormous power and influence and which find ways of interfering and intervening in policy process in order to ensure, for example, that countries like Zambia adopt GMOs or uh, uh, use uh, terminator seeds uh, that can not uh, be stored for the next uh, planting season uh, in order to ensure that their markets uh, are guaranteed uh, in the context of the investments which they have made to produce better yielding varieties or disease resistant varieties uh, and the like. This in turn has fed into a mobilization of uh, uh, much more attention around issues of titling uh, of land. Uh, again, uh, on a scale which we have not seen before uh, on the continent. Uh, the assumption of user and ownership rights that previously governed the African agricultural sector has become a most hazardous assumption today uh, to make uh, as governments have themselves uh, invested in the process of titling, uh, sometimes for purely revenue reasons, but also I would argue uh, a lot of the times for reasons connected to the supposed benefits uh, which such titling policies uh, could bring uh, to the development of the agricultural sector. Uh, benefits which uh, many of you uh, whom I have read uh, and present here have contested uh, in terms of the benefits and out outcomes for uh, the agricultural sector uh, and the suggestion that ultimately uh, in a lot of cases titling has been a first step towards dispossession for many small uh, holders and uh, peasant uh, households. Uh, but nevertheless, it's, it's a process which uh, has come to stay. It's a trend which is there and uh, a market has in fact uh, emerged in land titles uh, across the continent, a secondary market in land titles uh, which uh, constitutes part of a broader political economy uh, of urbanization and transitions in African uh, agriculture. Um, the range of non-state actors uh, present in the agricultural sector um, also should be uh, taken in the context of the fact that uh, uh, the experiences of drought and famine which we have known on the continent uh, increased both the legitimacy and the authority uh, of non-state uh, players in the determination of agricultural policy and in the lobbying for uh, improved practices both amongst farming communities but also with regard uh, to the political authorities uh, and uh, the regimes uh, uh, policy regimes which they seek to uh, promote. Now, all of this background I have, I have tried to spell out, um, not simply to 
to underscore the importance of this conference. It is important in its own right anyway. Uh, but partly to help me to get into um, a broader discussion of uh, the kinds of debates set in a historical context which we have had around the political economy uh, of agriculture on the continent. Um, and I do so taking it for granted. Um, and I think Amatya Sen probably has made this statement much more eloquently than, than, than any of us uh, could make it, that uh, in a sense politics uh, and agriculture are not strange bedfellows. The question which has always been at the heart of our debates is precisely how to interpret the political processes around which agricultural policies have been formulated on our continent. And here, I think, um, over the last few years, the dominant framework which has informed much of the discussions that we have had can be described as one centering around the new patrimonial approaches. I would argue that this approach, for all of the benefits which it has offered in trying to understand the nature and the use of power in Africa is itself fraught with problems. Uh, problems which uh, can be summarized in terms of its omnibus nature as being an explanatory framework that seems to enjoy the unique but problematic capacity to explain everything that goes on in the African world, whether it be in the domain of politics or in the domain of economics, or in the workings and configuration of social relationships, uh, the capacity of the framework to present itself as a universal and enduring variable uh, ultimately also constitutes its own weakness uh, in terms of its inability uh, to unpack beyond the general, uh, the general levels uh, of the distribution and use of power and the clientelist relationships that are supposed to underpin the deployment and use of power uh, to begin to allow for the exercise of agency, particularly in contexts such as those provided uh, by the agricultural sector. And here I think the critiques which have been offered uh, of the new patrimonial model uh, of economic uh, of, of analysis and of interpretation uh, should probably begin to invite us also uh, to think of alternative frames of understanding politics, economy, and society on the African continent that are not reductionist uh, by definition, but which seek to understand the way complex ways in which individuals and groups as actors in society negotiate interests in order to achieve an equilibrium that is acceptable and sufficient for a season. The way in which interests and individuals negotiate an equilibrium that is sufficient for a season. And I define that negotiation in terms of what I call a social contract a contract which defines the bargain between state and society, and which in the context of some of the uh, work which is being undertaken on the continent today, the writings of people like Tandika Mkandawire, but also the output of recent of institutions like the Economic Commission for Africa, uh, is summarized in terms of the search for a new democratic developmental framework that will at once speak to the aspirations of the populace for long-term development anchored on an expanded production base in which agriculture plays a central, perhaps even a determinant role uh, in some cases, uh, but which nevertheless also uh, understands uh, the centrality of politics, particularly the politics of inclusion, of representation, in some the politics of democratization as a central element of the dynamic of a developmental state uh, project. Let me therefore, in the context of this broad framework, suggest that between the two broad competing political economies which we have today, the classical one, which uh, basically centers around an analysis of interests, call them classes, 
uh, and the um, various other sub-interests that constellate around classes on the continent and the new political economy approach, the public choice approach, sometimes also called the rational choice approach, uh, which we find in the writings and the works of people like Robert Bates, uh, drawing inspiration from Lipton. Uh, I would pitch my camp, as I have tried to do over the years, in the camp of a classical political economy approach, which does not seek from the outset to pathologize politics on the continent, certainly not pathologize agricultural politics on the continent, but to understand it as part of a dynamic of power uh, and the expression of power that could be developmental as much as it could be anti-developmental. And therefore, uh, poses the question, not so much in abstract terms uh, of a conceptual nature, but as empirical questions that are to be interrogated through ethnographic research uh, in specific contexts where those issues are presented uh, before us. It therefore suggests to me that although we can move towards efforts at building a macro politics, a macro political economy uh, of agricultural politics on the continent, we must also be warned and cautious uh, to the importance of micro studies that enable us to understand the ways in which the silences and the actions of rural communities may impact on policy and the direction of the policy choices which states make on the African continent. I have never accepted the analysis which was always central to the Liptonian urban bias uh, thesis, powerful and influential as that thesis was when it was uh, introduced, uh, and also uh, important as the subsequent modifications and updates which Michael Lipton himself has made to the urban bias thesis. I have never accepted that the rural population has not been able in its experience to exercise agency either by its silence or by its participation in direct processes of policy making. And one can look at this in terms of the history of rural Africa and of its composition in the period from the onset of colonial rule, where the rural population was itself central to the strategy of a, pol a colonial economy that was in the making. It was, after all, the colonial authorities who threw two master strokes, the monetary policy which they introduced and the fiscal policy which they adopted. The taxation of rural communities and households succeeded in shifting agricultural policy in favor of cash crops which the colonial authorities wanted produced in order to feed metropolitan industries. And yet, at the time when the colonial authorities across the continent, in Francophone as in Anglophone, pushed their luck a bit further by introducing hot taxes of various kinds, what became the poll tax in the UK during the Thatcher years, and which elicited the same kind of reaction amongst the populace. The rural population mobilized. It was indeed one of the most vibrant periods in the history of rural Africa when populations mobilized themselves precisely to resist the unjust taxations and ultimately produced a politicization of the rural milieu that set the stage for the nationalist anti-colonial movements that ultimately ushered Africa into independence. Now, independence may not itself have succeeded in reversing the structure of the colonial economy Africa did remain vertically integrated into the international system, and the pattern of production of commodities inherited at independence was carried over into the post-colonial period, with some investments made by the newly independent states as part of the anti-colonial social contract uh, that ushered in independence uh, in extension activities, for example, uh, in the provision of um, uh, additional tasks to marketing boards, marketing boards that had been set up in the colonial period, uh, to increases in the amounts paid to uh, uh, rural uh, producers uh, for the cash crops which uh, they generated. Various, I would call, 
I would, I would say, um, minor additional incentives introduced by the post-colonial the post -colonial government, uh, basically to sustain a structure that they inherited at independence, uh, but which effectively uh, translated again into a process of selective repoliticization by rural communities uh, of episodes of resistance, which may not have resonated on a global scale, but which in fact were important in shifting the parameters of the relationships that had been constructed in the agricultural sector in the period after independence. Uh, for those who are from Nigeria, for example, you remember the Agbekoya uprising uh, of farmers basically uh, engaging uh, the authorities in sustained battles over periods uh, <laughs> running for months at a time in order to get a shift in policy around access to land and around the pricing of uh, cocoa, the cocoa crop uh, of Western Nigeria uh, in order to get better terms for themselves uh, and for their households. So the rural communities have never been silent uh, in that regard. Uh, and in my own understanding of it, the exercise of silence uh, before public policy and the exercise of voice has always been an important and twin dynamic uh, that does not speak of a docile and voiceless rural community, but one which in fact was stacked against a structure of incentives, a structure of incentives in economy, politics, and society that was historically loaded against the agricultural sector and which has never been reversed uh, to this day. Um, indeed, your comment, uh, your introductory comment, that in spite of all of the rhetoric around CADAP and of the interest in investing more in agriculture across the continent, we find that the agricultural sector is steeped in a process of long-term decline uh, on the African continent, as indeed uh, in other regions of the world. The only difference and the only center or, or issue of of crucial importance from a political point of view uh, being whether the fault for this decline has to be placed at the doorstep of the peasant small scale, a uh, small holder farmer, uh, or is indeed the consequence of a structure of incentives uh, introduced in the colonial period, consolidated in the post-colonial period, uh, in some cases uh, worsened by the exploitation of mineral resources uh, and uh, ambitions towards an industrial uh, strategy uh, structured around import substitution industrialization that has produced an inexorable exodus of population from the rural to the urban and uh, uh, a, an inevitable long-term decline uh, in the contribution uh, of uh, agriculture to the GDP of most African countries. It seems to me, therefore, that the issues which are posed to us today uh, around agricultural development are those which we could better understand in terms of the broader macro and economic framework and the ways in which we might begin to reconfigure the structure of incentives in order, first and foremost, to favor production on the continent. Uh, a continent which um, uh, over the last 25 years certainly has known uh, a structure of incentives which has not been favorable to the real sectors of the economy, uh, whether it be in terms of the rates of interest which are charged or the rates uh, uh, of um, inflation which prevail in the economy or with regard to the exchange rates uh, regime operated by governments or with regard to the absence of investments in infrastructure, uh, investors in agriculture and in industry know on the continent of Africa today that the odds are against them in terms of their capacity to expand production and to embark on a process of accumulation that could be favorable uh, to the domestic development process. I do not, of course, in all of this mean to suggest that corruption is not an issue uh, in the agricultural sector or in African economies. Uh, the politics of the allocation of resources, whether it be in the dirigist regime or under the market liberalization regimes of the structural adjustment period, has been uniformly characterized 
by corruption. And the issue for us is not a choice between the state as being less corrupt or more corrupt, or the market as being less corrupt or more corrupt. Both in practice have been, have been rife with corrupt practices. Uh, but it's rather one of how, as I said, we reconfigure the structure of incentives precisely to favor domestic accumulation and to define a role for agriculture in that framework that will probably begin to move product producers away from raw material production into higher value chain forms of activity that ultimately feed into a logic of industrialization uh, on the continent. And it is precisely in this logic of uh, expanding the productive base of African economies in ways that will enable the incentives that are introduced to elicit the responses which are expected and which are forecast by the designers of incentives that I think the notion of the developmental state uh, becomes uh, important uh, for us to keep in mind. Uh, developmentalism has of course been criticized precisely because in its origins it was accompanied by authoritarianism. Uh, and Africa has known, uh, I think we will agree, sufficient authoritarianism uh, to be uh, condemned once again uh, to a new round of authoritarianism. The democratic ethos, however, is also deep-seated in African society. Nowhere more so in agrarian societies, uh, in the rural milieu, where processes of decision-making and processes of the exercise of choice uh, have always been imbued by process, by systems of consultation, uh, which do not figure in the formal and pro-formal systems of democratization that we have established, but which speak to an embedded consciousness around rights, around participation, and around inclusion, which I believe can be tapped into in order to construct a democratic developmental state model that will enable us to begin to shift the structures of incentives uh, in African economy and society in favor of expanded production in agriculture, improved productivity, the nexus between agriculture and industry, the nexus between agriculture and services, and ultimately an understanding that the conjugation of the politics of agriculture is not to be restricted simply to the agricultural sector itself, but will ultimately be found in decisions which are taken in relation to other sectors of the economy and with regard to the overall macroeconomic management framework which we adopt for our countries. Uh, and I would also add to the macro social policy environment that is integral to the social contracts that must be established in order for a proper equilibrium that is sufficient for the time and for the season uh, within which politics and governance can express themselves can be effectively identified and played out. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Adibayo, for such a stimulating uh, presentation. I think uh, the, plenary, uh, the plenary will agree with me that uh, that was a very, very uh, stimulating uh, presentation. I will not attempt uh, to summarize what uh, he has uh, presented because I would not be able uh, to do so. But nonetheless, I think I will try to do so in just two sentences. I think what his presentation has done is to present a broad outline of the contemporary context of agricultural policy making uh, in Africa. And basically what his presentation has, done, has tried to do is to challenge the conventional thinking about uh, the political economy of uh, policy processes in Africa. And he has tried to present uh, an alternative that suggests new ways of trying to understand the political economy of uh, politics, power, and uh, 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 policy uh, in Africa. On this basis, once again, Adibayo, uh, thank you. And I would like now to open up, I think, uh, um, uh, uh, the, the, the discussion. I think uh, there will be either in for, I mean, uh, form of questions or uh, comments. But what I would like to emphasize is that uh, we should try as much as possible to be brief and concise so that uh, 
a large number of us can contribute to this uh, exciting uh, topic. Who would like to um, start the discussion? Yeah, this is Regina Birner from the University of Hohenheim in Germany. Thank you for this excellent and exciting presentation. You mentioned the taxation of agriculture, especially the export products, as one of the major issues. Now, recent evidence from a large research project led by Kim Anderson has shown that on the average, this taxation of export products actually does not exist any longer. So that would be a major change. What is your interpretation on why that happened and what implication it has? <laughs> Uh, thank you very much. Adelibu Olomola from IFPRI, Nigeria. Uh, I think this is a very excellent presentation. Uh, it has addressed the broad framework that uh, we should consider to consider in the articulation of agricultural policy Africa-wide, and even the future issues uh, that we need to target uh, our policies in terms of moving agriculture forward. Uh, in the broad analysis, the issue of urbanization and demographics uh, came up. And this is very important and creates a very serious challenge for agricultural policy makers. Uh, uh, the paper emphasized, for example, in terms of the demographics, Africa, you know, has the highest rate of urbanization in the world. And even some countries in particular, large countries, even ha have very high uh, growth rates. Uh, now we have uh, a large proportion of this urban population has been used. Now, if you juxtapose this with the high rate of unemployment in the continent and in some of these countries, now we have a very serious problem on our hand. Now there is no job in the urban areas where they are, and then the rural areas where they have left continue to be also be uh, uh, underdeveloped. And this has given rise to various uh, types of conflicts uh, uh, in, those, in those economies. And, and if you have this kind of conflicts, it will even be more difficult to develop the economy in general, not to talk about agriculture in particular. The challenge that this will pose to uh, policy makers, therefore, is how to develop uh, uh, cultural policies for youth that will encourage youth participation in their culture. And if I want to encourage this, what type of agriculture will the youth participate in? Will it be the type of agriculture their forefathers participated in? Certainly no. There's therefore need for investment in terms of modernizing the sector to attract the youth. Therefore, agriculture must leave being an occupation or a project to be an enterprise, a business. And all the parameters in business organizations you can need to apply to agriculture. And unless we do this, and uh, 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 institutions like FACS and other NGOs that are adv advocating increased productivity in agriculture, you can need to see how the youth will be involved. Uh, okay. So I, I think this, this, this challenge is, especially in the area of youth involvement and in, uh, in agriculture and investment and modernization of the sector to make it a business is a challenge that I want the organizers to uh, address. Thank you very much. My name is Glenn Tyler and I work for Greenpeace Africa. Um, I think I'm just picking up on what um, the last person was talking about um, and also what you were talking about in terms of when there is a commodity boom in a country, you often see food security and agricultural policy perhaps neglected. 
And this idea of um, getting more people involved in agriculture, um, at Greenpeace we promote ecological agriculture and that's often seen as something that can be a lot more labor and intensive and sort of a, a source of employment. And I wonder if in your development work, if you've seen um, any of this come about and if you also see agriculture um, as, a as a place where um, employment can be created, especially through uh, methods like ecological agriculture, um, and how you see um, strategies to get people into the agricultural sector when you also spoke about the youth um, population boom and particularly in urban, in urban um, areas, how we can get people back to um, agriculture and seeing agriculture as a viable um, livelihood. Thanks. Um, My name is Kwajo Asensochri from IFPRI, Ghana. Um, and I thank you very much, as usual, for your brilliant um, presentation. Um, you, 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 you connoted negativity to um, direct investment in land. I will never call it um, land grabs, as uh, some writers have called it. Um, I think it's um, an investment just like any other investment in agriculture. Um, what can you say, what positive things can you give to um, investments in land in Africa? I ask this because um, this question was posed to um, a state minister in Ethiopia some time ago, and his response was that um, Ethiopia has 72 million hectares of land. They've used about 12 million hectares, and the rest is idle. So if you are able to invest in this, as anything, uh, whether a corporation or a country or whatever, just like you invest in the factory or invest in something, why can't you bring resources that can be used to develop agriculture? Why do we always connote negativity to um, this sort of uh, venture? Uh, what can you say about it? What, what are the positive aspects of direct investment in, in agriculture? And how can we use it as a development tool for uh, Africa? Thank you. Okay. Good morning. Uh, my name is Nick Sitko. I'm with Michigan State University. Um, Professor, I appreciate your, your challenge uh, to question the sort of universalizing and overly determinative or deterministic assumptions that underpin some of the urban bias theories that have guided a lot of our thinking on agricultural policy making. Um, and I, I really enjoy your challenge to bring in questions of agency and, and farmer voice into the discussion. But at the same time, I think that um, I believe equally important there are analyzing the ways in which farmers' voice have been captured by an elite minority. In this case, I'm thinking about uh, my experience in Zambia with the Zambian National Farmers Union and the way in which they can structure policies in a way that seem to limit the potential for truly small-scale farmers to enter into the cycle of appropriating public spending. So, I was interested in, in hearing your thoughts on, on that. Thank you. I appreciated your comments on the limitations of the patrimonial model and uh, directing us to pay broader attention to bargaining and, uh, and agreements. Uh, my question is a different one, however. You spoke about external actors influencing Zambian GMO policies. Uh, I just was wondering whether you believe that introduction of GMOs in sub-Saharan Africa would harm the farm sector or benefit it. I, as you might imagine, I believe that it's actually a catastrophe that uh, African countries haven't yet managed to properly manage the GMO sector and provide some benefits to their farmers. 
associated with it. Well, thank you very much for uh, the comments and the observations. Um, for the colleague who made the observation with regard to taxation uh, of agricultural uh, exports, um, I'm not myself sure that it is, it is an across-the-board and uniform uh, experience. Um, there are instances where um, exportation tax, taxes on exports have been removed for specific commodities precisely to uh, promote a boom uh, in the quantities that are exported of such commodities. Cassava chips, for example, uh, would be one good example, uh, which is a growth area, perhaps one of the fastest growth uh, areas in African agricultural uh, exports today. Um, but also keep in mind that at the same time as um, uh, efforts have been made to promote incentives favorable to the agricultural sector uh, in the last 25 years, there have also been pressures on African governments to boost internal, internally generated revenues. And the boosting of internally generated revenues has actually seen the introduction of agricultural export taxes uh, in several domains. Uh, accounting for a significant quantum beyond direct income taxes uh, of the composition of domestically generated uh, revenue. So I see more of a mixed picture uh, than of a, a decisively unidirectional decline in uh, uh, export taxes. Uh, what probably uh, has been more evident uh, has been uh, the removal of uh, the price biases uh, that previously uh, penalized uh, agricultural communities through uh, some of the liberalization measures uh, which were introduced and which some have argued uh, perhaps also in a sense undermines aspects of the urban bias thesis uh, in terms of the twists which um, which uh, Lipton referred to in his original analysis and which certainly have been corrected to some extent in the context of uh, liberalization um, of uh, uh, economic policy uh, on the continent. Um, uh, with uh, Olomola's observation, I think it's just a, uh, a comment which, which I agree with. I think you set the challenge uh, quite uh, starkly. Um, the question of feeding the mass of urban residents and also generating jobs for the uh, younger people uh, is a big one which will dominate policy for the foreseeable future, but which I'm also uh, persuaded uh, would only be effectively addressed if we begin to uh, uh, shift the structure of incentives in a way that will strengthen the productive base and capacity uh, of African economies, uh, learning to produce again uh, and to do so uh, at an incremental level in the value chain uh, is at the heart of the discourse around the developmental state uh, in Africa. And incidentally, it's, uh, the late Ethiopian Prime Minister Mele Zedawi used to convene at least two sessions a year uh, with um, African thinkers, Tandikam Kandawire and others uh, in Addis Ababa and officials, uh, particularly his cabinet, uh, to look at uh, issues connected to how a developmental state agenda uh, could be constructed in Ethiopia that would, uh, that would um, represent a, a departure from uh, a system of economic policy making that seems to contain as many countervailing uh, factors and influences that prevent production as, uh, as incentives that are supposed uh, to liberate the productive energies of the, uh, of the continent. Um, but of course, the emphasis also is not simply on a developmental framework, but uh, a democratic underpinning for that developmental framework. So there was always an irony about Mele Zenawi being the convener uh, 
of uh, sessions to think about developmental states when uh, serious questions about the quality of Ethiopian democracy under his watch uh, was also uh, an issue that was posed uh, on a continuing basis, both within Ethiopia uh, and outside. Um, ecological agriculture has made its entry uh, on in the continent. Uh, when I spoke of experimental forms, uh, sometimes also connected with even uh, more sustainable production of fuel uh, on the continent. We've seen pockets of experimentation uh, taking place uh, across the continent. Um, my conviction, though, is that the agricultural sector itself uh, for the reason of the historic uh, structure of incentives, uh, which I referred to, uh, as being stacked against agriculture, cannot in its raw form be an attractive site uh, for an army of young people uh, to reinsert themselves. So, so many experiments and initiatives have been introduced to go back to land, uh, people should go back to rural areas, and it, it's not going to happen. The trend is still of population flowing from the rural to the urban. Uh, and it seems to me that it is here that the question of how to valorize agricultural production beyond raw production activities of raw commodities into processed forms that allow the application of higher levels of skill um, will become important. I mean, a few people might go back to the rural areas to run large-scale mechanized uh, farms and uh, agricultural operations. But for the majority of people, and what I see uh, in many countries, it's, it's precisely being able to take some of those commodities and process them uh, into uh, higher forms uh, of, 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 of commodity uh, processed in one form or the other, adding value of different kinds, which they can then uh, tie into a logic of small, medium enterprises uh, on the continent of uh, industrial policy. Uh, and it is precisely there that I think the jobs will be found. Um, the argument that Africa cannot expect structural transformation without deliberately promoting uh, industrial development uh, is, I think, from that point of view, a robust one. And an agriculture-led industrial development uh, uh, experience is indeed one which is very much on the cards on the continent uh, today. Uh, will, in fact, from next Wednesday, from this Wednesday, be the object of the, of the uh, discussion of the African Ministers of Finance uh, in their annual session with the ECA and the African Union uh, around agri and commodity-led industrialization in Africa in terms of the options which are, which are available. And I think it's important to keep in mind that um, a, a return to agriculture as a movement that will help us to absorb huge armies of people who are unemployed uh, will not happen on its own unless it is coupled with the services and with an industrial development strategy. Uh, people who are already in the urban areas uh, will remain in the urban areas, I assure you, no matter what. Uh, the difficulties are uh, of surviving uh, in the urban context, and there are difficulties involved in surviving in the urban context. Um, hmm. Kojo, thank you very much for your observation. Uh, the, the notion of land grabs, uh, I think, uh, was not meant, at least in my own usage, to suggest that investments in land are not welcome, in principle. Um, it is probably, I think, more in relation to the fact that the process of the alienation of land is also fraught with a lot of political contestation in a lot of cases. So lands are allocated to huge corporate communities, uh, to huge corporate interests, without the adequate definition of either a co community corporate responsibility in the worst cases, uh, or the presence of a proper regime of rules within which the alienation takes place. So it's a negotiation sometimes between uh, officials sitting in our capitals and investors coming and saying we want to take this swathe of land in order to produce, as though that land was simply fallow. Uh, 
And in a lot of cases, actually, there is no fallow land uh, that has no owner <laughs> in Africa uh, or that does not have uh, a community of use that is historically associated with it in which people can claim that actually this is our land that you are taking. It's not just free land that exists there for anybody to come to use, uh, especially in the context of shifting cultivation in which you might use a piece of land, a tract of land for a period of time and then uh, leave it to follow and, 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 and move on to other sites uh, to take such land without the adequate framework for negotiating use and access uh, has been at the heart of many of the angry contestations that we have had and which I think makes the notion of the grab to resonate. Now, having said that, I don't think we have done as great a job as we could do in negotiating the terms of foreign direct investment in land. And this speaks not just to land, but to almost every other thing we do with foreign direct investment, whether it be with regard to industry. We don't negotiate terms that allow a transfer of technologies uh, in meaningful ways. And uh, industries that are set up then become a drain pipe on the foreign exchange of the countries because we are permanently importing inputs uh, that ought to have been transferred over a period of time uh, because of the kinds of contracts which we set up. And it is not, I think, uh, broadly disputed that some of the terms on which land concessions have been granted by our governments are highly problematic. Uh, you cannot sign a contract that says that you give the rights to everything on the land and beneath it for 999 years to a company. I mean, what kind of negotiation is that? And sometimes just in order to get $5 million to buy weapons to fight battles in Kivu. It's probably the, an exaggerated example I'm giving to you, but there are people who are looking at the contracts and the terms. Now, you are producing food on land which the Saudis have bought in Saint Saloum in Senegal, the most fertile agricultural land in a Sahelian belt, and a country which is prone to drought and famine. And you do not have a negotiation that allows the food that is produced on that land to also serve the domestic market. In the meantime, you are asking for food aid at the first opportunity. So I think there is, there is a, a problem there um, which uh, we, we ought to be able to work with our governments to say, if we go this path, let us not repeat the mistakes of yesterday. But I don't mean to say that investment. And as I pointed out, actually, it's not a question of blaming or castigating foreign investors. I said it's actually a process that is both domestic and external. And that's the reality. I mean, there is nobody who is a general who is retired in Nigeria today who does not have a farm. <laughs> and when I say a farm, I mean a city. <laughs> yeah, a gated community that is called a farm. And it's huge tracts of land. And there are contestations around it too. There are people who are saying, no, they, they didn't compensate us. Or they paid us meager compensation. And uh, they, get, they got it because they were still wearing military uniform. So we could not resist. They just brought armed military guards and quickly fenced the land off. But we are talking of, uh, of, of, of sometimes uh, thousands of hectares of land uh, appropriated by retired civil servants and officers, uh, sometimes purely for recreational farming, uh, but in a handful of cases, hoping that this will be an alternative uh, vocation uh, on account of early retirement from office. So there are issues there which I think we need to um, look at. A colleague from uh, Michigan State University, you are right. Um, and that's what makes the politics of agricultural policy, I think, so complex because of the, uh, just like politics <laughs> in general, are so complex. Um, uh, and the hijack of the voice and even of the movements of, of, of rural communities has been an important part of the story 
of uh, agricultural, of the politics of agriculture uh, on the continent. Uh, it dates back to the colonial period. Uh, it has been deployed by governments in the post-independence uh, uh, period. And uh, the more I have thought about it, the more I have also been persuaded that the idea of uh, an alternative developmental state project cannot be meaningful uh, and would itself go the way of uh, other alternatives that have been uh, distorted, hijacked, corrupted, whatever, unless we also achieve um, a repoliticization uh, of rural communities uh, in which structures of accountability in the context of the exercise of active citizenship in the rural as in the urban context provide a constant check on the use of power uh, by those who are the custodians uh, of, the, uh, of the commonwealth and of the broad interests uh, of the rural communities. But um, your point is, is very well taken. Uh, the GMOs. Let me probably um, uh, respond to, to, to that observation and thank you for it. In terms of um, the way in which the seeds which are kept by the peasant community after the harvest and the sale of what is to be sold um, comprise an important element of household and community social security at a time when formal social security did not exist. We are in periods of shortage. Grains that have been saved for the next season could be kept for use over that next season. Or if there are no emergencies, constitute a start-off basis for planting at minimal costs and which some of the initiatives, including those around GMOs that are introduced as better and more effective alternatives, do not take adequate account of. Um, in a different context, Andika has talked about, Nkandawire has talked about this dynamic uh, of history, of culture, and of practices built around agricultural practices. Um, as, as an institutional monotasking, multitasking, an institutional multitasking in which what we may see as an activity or an event that serves only one single purpose, in fact responds to a multiplicity of purposes and of needs in community, which any change management process uh, that does not take fully into account that multitasking uh, is actually likely to find uh, to be a source of obstacle to the potentiality of its success. Uh, this is quite apart from all of the debates about the um, potential dangers associated with uh, GMOs, uh, even from the point of view of human health. I'm not a, a health specialist, but I read these debates and discussions. Uh, and I simply argue that even if it is not GMOs, uh, some of the uh, uh, better yielding varieties, what was called the terminator uh, seeds that were introduced, uh, have also confronted similar problems uh, connected with an absence of a proper sociology of the crop and of the seeds that are uh, introduced into the rural farming community. And people are surprised that there is rejection or there is resistance because they haven't understood uh, the full complexity woven around uh, particular practices uh, in such communities. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Ruth Onyango from Kenya. I know you didn't want to talk much about corruption. I don't know what name we put to it but uh, maybe just good governance. Uh, as you know, you talked about uh, mass alienation of uh, smallholder farmers, uh, robbing them of their land. As you do so, you keep them poor. They can't even, uh, they can't even uh, sustain or vote for a good government in power. What's worse now is alienation 
by the political elite, the governments of Africa themselves, and keeping the smallholder farmers poor. And once you are poor, you have no voice. So I wanted you to really address yourself to this issue and the very pertinent issues you are addressing. How do we get the masses, the impoverished, the disempowered, the poor, empowered to be able to have a voice to address the issues of uh, bad governance that we are seeing? You know, a lot of land being given out, but who is benefiting from that land being given out? I'm Anna Medikea from Aarhus University, and I have a question with regards to uh, something you mentioned in your introduction about the recent growth uh, period in Africa and how you interpreted it as, um, I think you said, a boom in commodity prices. Now, there's been a debate about the drivers of the recent growth, and I know that some opinions, for example, in Stephen Radley's recent book on the 17 emerging countries in Africa, he says that it's also a result of real productivity increases. Others says that you know, the growth is more um, a result of investments in mining and so on, or aid-driven services, public services, and so on. So I would just like you to maybe expand a little bit about your interpretation of the recent growth and the drivers of it. Okay, thank you very much. I, I don't shy away from talking about corruption. Um, but my, my, my take is that corruption is everywhere. Um, and to the extent to which it uh, constitutes part of the day-to-day -day concerns we have to deal with on the continent, um, we must understand it um, in the context of a configuration and dynamic of power that um, begets, begets those corrupt practices uh, to, which, to which we refer. Uh, and it, it's a large topic. It's a big debate, um, which we could probably spend an entire afternoon discussing in terms of what causes corruption in Kenya, or in Nigeria, or in South Africa. Uh, what are the patterns of corruption? Uh, that take place uh, in different countries? What are their consequences uh, for economy and society uh, and the like? Um, but I, I don't know. I, 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 I sometimes uh, argue that we should not also take um, a temporal process of disempowerment uh, and translate it into a permanent narrative of disempowerment. Uh, and there's no doubt that uh, there are moments in the politics of our countries in which the poor uh, find themselves to be completely beaten uh, to a point of almost invisibility and voicelessness. But there are also moments when those periods pass, when you see a mobilization amongst poor people uh, to push for change. And to the extent to which Kenya has known the kinds of change which it has known, it was not because Moi wanted change. It was not because Kanu wanted change. It was not because the dominant elites wanted change. And to the extent to which those changes took place, it's precisely because of the pressures that came from below. Um, I've read literature which said that pressures also from outside uh, the sanctions against uh, the Moy regime and, and all of that. But in fact, I would in this particular instance, instance privilege the pressures that came from within <coughs> Kenyan society itself at various levels, from the working poor to the marginal people in the slums of Kibera and others around Nairobi and other places, um, to begin to demand a more accountable form of government. Um, <laughs> to a point where I think Kenya today has one of the most engaged and active citizenry that I see on the continent. Um, our constitution, when you read about debates around the constitution of Kenya, people feel that this was, they got their own constitution um, against attempts to prevent certain clauses from being inserted of uh, a, a justice system where you actually had an open 
an accountable process in choosing a chief justice. So these are not easy, easy victories that have been won. Now, <laughs> if you look at it against the election outcome, you might feel discouraged and say, well, <laughs> so all of this for what? All of this for what? But I think there is a conversation that is taking place in Kenya now. That I do not expect that Uhuru Kenyatta, if he were to govern, will govern the way that Jomo Kenyatta governed. Because there is already enough politicization in Kenyan society beyond change and reform that goes to the heart, not just of good governance as a technical category, but of democratic governance as a political category. Uh, and you know, the ruling class may hijack processes or attempt or subvert the will of the people in one form or the other, but you have dynamic years ahead uh, in Kenya. Uh, and I hope that this will refract itself into the agricultural uh, sector uh, for the benefit especially of, this, of the dying tribe of, uh, of smallholders. Uh, in the country. Well, I don't know. I, I may not have answered your question. It's more complex for me than simple um, formulations of an um, outright disempowerment uh, that does not, in fact, allow for uh, the exercise of voice and agency, however intermittent uh, and episodic even uh, that might be from time to time, from period to period. But you inhabit a moment, as I see it, that is perhaps one of the most dynamic uh, since the independence of Kenya, I in wish which, Kenya. yeah, so I mean, the of of uh, no, I know, I mean, but but you have that also in, in several countries. In Senegal, where I live, um, I we don't have time, but uh, the defeat of the ward presidency would not have been possible if it was not the urban unemployed youth uh, of Senegal <laughs> who mobilized. Ward was defeated a year before the elections took place. A full year, he was a lame duck president. It was just a ritual that was to be fulfilled uh, to get him out of office. If any Senegalese is here, I'm sure they'll confirm uh, that effectively from the moment he had to withdraw the bill from the assembly that was meant to consolidate his hold on power. Uh, and the entire country went up. It did not start from Dakar, by the way. It began from the silent rural communities of Senegal. That's where the demonstration started. And when it got to Dakar, it was a completely different picture. Malawi, well, blessings and others have been writing on, on the Malawi context. And the struggles, both in support of the agricultural policy that uh, the late Mutarika introduced, the subsidy issues, for example, in the face of international opposition, but also the resistance to the authoritarianism of a president who became drunk with power. I mean, so I, I think there's, we, 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 are, we are going through interesting times uh, on the continent. And uh, Kenya is not exceptional. It's just that I like Kenya uh, as, as, a, as a person. A day in Kenyan politics is a very long time. And uh, alliances change so frequently that it reminds me of, uh, of Nigerian politics. Um, in terms of the driver of growth, I've seen different suggestions. Um, I said that with the exception of Ethiopia, perhaps, uh, which is not really enjoying a commodity boom. Um, in my view, the rate of growth which we are experiencing on the continent today will probably not be at the level at which it is if it had not been for a major boost in the global prices of key commodities. Because even without necessarily increasing productivity, you are going to have an increase in receipts <coughs> from the export of the same quantity of commodities. So for a country which, for example, exports 2 million tons of, say, cotton, uh, or of cocoa or coffee or whatever, those commodities that agricultural commodities especially that have enjoyed uh, a, a boost in prices, um, the income flows have simply doubled in some cases. Um, and the impact on the revenue uh, receipts of, 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 of the treasury uh, have been refracted into the economy. Uh, whether they have been reinvested wisely 
is one of the issues which the ECA report on the, uh, on the economic report on Africa that will be launched on Wednesday at the Conference of Finance Ministers uh, has touched upon. Because for me, much more important than what, whether it is productivity gains or other factors that are at the heart of the current growth episode. I don't agree that it's simply productivity gains. Uh, but much more important for me is what we do with the proceeds of growth. That's far more important. Are we going, for example, to, in, from the point of view of an agricultural community, begin to pay attention to issues of rural infrastructure that still explain why more than half of what we produce on the farms get rotten at the farm gate for want of transport and of uh, quick ways of getting them into urban markets, not to talk of export markets. I mean, these are, these are some of the basic issues that previous growth episodes have raised and which were not properly tackled, but which we hope that the current uh, episode, for as long as it lasts, and no growth episode lasts forever, for as long as it lasts, will be judiciously utilized in order to expand productive capacity and also to reduce wastage, uh, such as we have known it in the agricultural sector. Um, some countries that ask for food aid uh, would not have needed food aid if, if we were able to prevent the farm gate losses uh, that, that of tomatoes, of perishable items like tomatoes, oranges, fruits, uh, vegetables of various kinds that are central to uh, food security, but which we do not effectively tap into uh, always. Uh, I was just expressing uh, our thanks to our professor for stimulating uh, an interesting uh, discussion and engagement, and it remains for us to uh, thank him for agreeing to uh, uh, give this key note ad address. At this point, I would like uh, to ask all of you to uh, give a hand for him. <laughs>